<laughs> I ran up on that. Welcome, I, welcome, I know. welcome to another edition of All Ball Chicago. I'm your co-host, Robert Bobby Reed. And I got the legend, the MVP veteran, the McDonald's All-American, the host, Mike, uh, Marcus Liberty. I'm going to say McDonald Liberty. Marcus Liberty, but we got a special guest in the building. One of Chicago's most electric, high flying, sky flies, three time parade All American. You name it, Mr. Roddy Fields in the building. What's up, Roddy? Guys, man, thanks for having me on, man. No doubt. Man, no thanks doubt. for coming on, man. I just want to let you know you're one of the most electric guys I ever seen play the game, dude. And we was talking before we got on air real quick, Liv, and he was saying it was a dude that jumped higher than him. And I was like, 50 years vertical? Come on, you had a 50, man. Who could jump higher than a 50? Man, I seen some guys that I'm telling you, I was, before we went off, you know, got disconnected, just talking about some of the guys that I've seen that a lot of people haven't seen, you know, from the likes of the, um, you know, like I say, a guy like Antoine Hall. Um, like with grace, like this, he, I mean, anything, I'm even talking about today's dunkers, like he can blend in in any era in terms of his style and the way he was able to like do some of the things that I could do, Vince could do, Mike can do. He had all that. Right. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Though. I'm going to let Liv go do his thing and I, I go straight to the skinny of it, but Roddy Fields in the building. Go ahead, Liv. You know I get hyped with a real brother here. No, it's all good, man. But, Ronnie, man, it's, it's a pleasure having you on, my brother, man. And, you know, me and you had chopped it up a while back about, you know, basically trying to do something, man. But, first of all, I want to say big big ups to you, man, for doing your thing for our youth back home in Chicago because uh, – you Thank are you. a legend. You are a legend, man. You, you deserve your credit. So that's why one of the reasons why we started All Ball Chicago, man. We all positive, no negativity, man. So just Thank tell you. them a little bit about your, you know, your upbringing. Who was rocking your hand when you were uh, a youngster, man? So so people can understand, you know, a little bit your your path of how you got to be where you became a successful All American in high school. Well, you know, for me, like I said, it's, it's all been a tradition, like even from, you know, you older guys that kind of set the, the tone for a lot of us guys, the younger guys, and especially just in Chicago ball, to just continue to follow, like, you know, the path that a lot of greats such as yourself, Isaiah, Tim, um, Kendall Gill, I mean, you know, Jamie Brandon, um, and the list goes on and on. And for us guys to like, be able to come along and, you know, put ourselves, you know, pretty much in that, in that picture with the rest of you guys, it was just like kind of, you know, continue to move this, this torch along with, you know, so many Chicago great ball players that we in, you know, we in basically and put out over years and years. Um, you know, the fortunate part with a lot of times with a lot of Chicago players, it's like, yeah, we know for our toughness, our grittiness, not backing down, but then also it's other things that and hurt a lot of, you know, guys over the course of time where sometimes people, you know, you know, outside of that's not from where we from tend to look at things of you being around the wrong crowd or the wrong people. But as we coming up playing ball, those people that we was around pretty much that, you know, we just grew up in that area, that environment. Um, and sometimes you can't change that at that point because, you know, you're striving to try to get in, you know, get to a certain place in life. Um, but at that point in time, when you're that young, you just enjoy your environment and, and the, the places, you know, where you grew up at. And for some of the guys that was playing ball, some of the guys that was hanging out, but some of you was your good friends that didn't play ball, but they wanted to hang out. Um, for me, I still respect my friends. They respect what I did. But for me, I wanted to just be on the court and play ball every morning before school, um, you know, and out to school. And that's something I enjoy doing. And mm. I realized later on that my skill set of what I was doing was kind of opening some eyes at an early age to me. I go in house, watch TV, you know, watch games, look at some of y'all games. You know, my coaches tell me about a lot of y'all, y'all teams and stuff like that. And I was just like, 
me is just trying to like get to that point to, you know, hopefully just be talked about one day um, for, you know, just being a great, you know, great player, working hard. And, and that's when, you know, when you start like getting in a newspaper in eighth grade, you're like, okay, I must have done something. In eighth grade? Yeah. Wow. Were you yeah. taking off in eighth grade? Well, my this was so crazy. I didn't realize I was ranked as the number one freshman in the country. Wow. 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 And that and that and and when I was like the top eighth grader, to me, I ain't look at it like that. You know, at the time, because it was like some other good players, and I was just really getting into the groove of really loving basketball at mm-hmm. seventh grade. Because I, you know, the first, you know, my sixth grade year when I tried to play, you know, may rest in peace, Coach Little, that used to coach at Kenny King, he cut me. Oh, Coach Little, manly. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, dang, I must have not be that good. That was a sixth grade. Wow. <laughs> Wow! So what I, did is I just kept going back to the court every morning, and with the older guys, see, I was able to go out there and play with like Fatty Cox and Tony Brown. All those guys, they give me like in the little, you know, like two, three minutes a game. But for me, that was like a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to like playing with some of those guys. So it was like, okay. All right, they give me man two minutes. I'm just, you know, anybody else like two minutes, they'll be mad. For me, I was like in the candy store. <laughs> Come on with that two minutes. Right. Yeah, like give me that two minutes. I went out there, probably got about five shots up in those two minutes. They <laughs> right back out. But so, so. they started letting me play with them a look, you know, little by little. And then when I played with the kids my age, it was like unfair. Wow. Because I'm up to like, wait a minute. Now, y'all don't know how to play basketball. Because I was playing with these guys that had been in the pros, played overseas, slapping me around. That was another thing. You know, I guess that, you know, that's in the era, like I said, even with, you know, watching the last dance, it just bring back so many memories of, like, back in the days when basketball was so physical on just the way guys defended, the way guys went out to you. And in Chicago – you know, that's just the way it was. You was it wasn't going wasn't no easy nights. Right. You know, because of people saying, Oh, you have 40, 50, or 35 and all. It wasn't no easy nights. It was plenty of nights that in high school I'm going home icing and getting in soaking in baths, like, you know, like, okay, what the hell is this? Right. But that's what we had to adjust to playing that way and understanding that way of basketball. Man, Roddy, I was looking at your numbers, man, real quick, Lib. I was just saying, in high school, when he he went to, I just wanted to say this real quick, Lib. In high school, you averaged 32, 12 rebounds, five assists, five blocks, four steals, and four and a half dunks a game? Yeah. Yeah. Think about this for a minute. And Marcus, you know this as well. When you start gaining the knowledge and experience of playing, especially with me, every year, like from your freshman to your sophomore year, you either going to improve and and take this wisdom with you, or you are going to be a player that stay the same, that stay the same and not improve. So when you look at it, look at your numbers from year to year. Mm-hmm. So when I came in as a freshman. I was starting varsity. Whoa! I averaged sixteen points a game, but in my eyes, over the summer from seventh and eighth grade. I was already playing with older guys, older than the high school guys. Right. So I didn't look at those. I looked at them like they were still my age. And those guys were juniors and seniors. Wow. So for me, it was like 16 my um, freshman year, 21 my sophomore year. And then Kevin came. I was averaging 25. He was averaging 27. And then when he left, it was like, Man, all that wisdom and knowledge I gained, now I'm averaging what you just – and this is the thing. Going into the playoffs, my last three games, I was averaging close to 40. Dang. You know, and, Ronnie, and, Ronnie, what, and what I always – because I watch you – I remember I went to a game y'all played at Loyola. 
Uh, I don't know what team it was, but y'all put on a show. Man. Like, uh, but what I liked about you when I was watching, I said he has a high IQ. He knows when to pass. He knows when to shoot. He knows when to take over the game. So I was always impressed, you know, watching you when you were doing that. And a lot of people don't give you that credit, man, because they be looking at the dunks and all that. I'm looking at how you how well you understood the game, man. But see, Marcus, like you're a guy that has played at the highest level and you understand basketball past that. A lot of people, like you said, they'll look at, okay, man, he had dunks and this and that. But this is the thing that people don't understand, like, I never forced anything in double teams in terms of games. Like you said, when the teams is like, okay, we doubling and tripling him. Let these other guys beat us. And I was like, all right, well, hey, guys, y'all knock these shots down. I'm going to pass it to you. Mm-hmm. And then in, in parts of the game. But this is the thing. Through another game of watching a lot of ball players of knowing the moment of saying, all right, now your team needs you. Okay, now y'all been on the drought. You know, this team had made like a, a, a 10 to 2 run and, and and nobody else can probably get buckets in this moment to stop the momentum. I knew that at an early age. Mm-hmm. And as people not realizing like basketball, basketball, they'll look at the highlights and all that. But looking at like to have the assists, the rebounds, the points. And this is the thing. What he's saying, the 32 a game at that time, when everybody already knew, okay, Kevin gone. We going to double that triple the hell out of you. That was my senior, and I'm still averaging 30-something a game. Damn. Yeah. And they were tripling you, man? Man, it was ridiculous. That's why at times when I, like I say, watch the last dance, and I tell a lot of youth now, my biggest thing, and Marcus contested this, watching basketball today, you miss a lot of great players. But a lot of these players to play back then when you guys was much more muscular, stronger, physically intimidating, much more realized centers in the game, Mm seven-footers, shot Mm -hmm. blockers. I mean, guys that just, hey, a regular foul, like, hey, you get clothesline, that's considered, that's a regular foul. Right, Mm -hmm. right. You know, a guy elbow you in your throat, that, hey, hey, man, you bet, hey, you keep, you just got to (laughs) play. Something, man, listen. And that was like, look at time in the games. I looked at the ref. I just stopped looking at the ref. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what? I ain't going to even say nothing, man. I'm just going to look, play this game, look at the outcome when it's over. Because I'm saying, if, like, I told one ref, man, if you would have gave me half the fouls I had, I might would have had 65 tonight. Right, <laughs> right. And I mean, I tell people this story, and it's so crazy. It was Manly High School. Uh-huh. In 96, and I never forget this. They was like, I mean, they had some some guards. I mean, like Pit Bulls and Rockwell is mixed. These guards Ooh. were fearless. And I'm up here like, man, we had to move the game up to a, um Malcolm X College because it was so sold out. And the first thing I'm hearing, and I was never a trash talker. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'm hearing is these guys. Man, you a bomb. This will happen. Kevin Garnett gone. You ain't going to do this. We finna destroy y'all. Wow. And I got a bunch of young guys on my team at the time. Mm-hmm. So I'm up here like game start. Now think about this. You're only playing eight minute quarters, right? Right. Okay. So put it like this. At halftime, I had three fouls and three points. And we was down 14. At half? At half. Wow. They stopped they and they looked at me, I ain't say nothing the whole time in the locker room. Nothing. Second half, let's just put it like this. I <laughs> end up with 47, and we won by 10. <laughs> I oh. knew I give a clip, I get my daughter got it. They said, you scored 44 points in 16 minutes. I said, yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. That got to be a record. So, so, so in other words, they woke up a beast. Man, listen, this is the thing I never forget I tell people. When the second half started, and I never forget, you remember the, the pass that Scotty gave to Mike in the Olympics when Mike did a lean in down the middle? Yeah. Bear Rome on the break, and I was at the baseline. I seen their big man about 6'9", and I see Jamel. He's pushing it. He looked back. I just hauled off running. <laughs> 
Man, he dropped that thing every back free throw line. One bounce. I dunked on the big dude so hard. You know the pads of Malcolm X College when they used to have a pro am? Right. I remember I that. To the back pad, the place erupted. After that, I hit about like six threes in a row. And then I look, as I'm walking past the bench and they coach, I kid you not. It was like they seen the ghost. They just all stared at me. <laughs> <laughs> but this say nothing. Like and they coach it was like as I walk all the way to the bench during the timeout, they didn't say they just stare looking at me like, okay, this dude ain't human. But this is what I told people like when you realize you start doing amazing things, when you start looking at reaction of other people. Yeah. Right. And that's when I was like, okay, it's something special that you know I'm able to do and bring out. And my teammates, they even looked at me weird after the game in the locker room. Like, what the heck got into you, man? Man, I don't know what was going on, but I was just like, I know I was mad, but they could tell I was mad as I'm sitting in the locker room, the coach yelling. <laughs> you were like, okay. And right. I was like, I was just like, they just thought I was just maybe just, I don't know, one into it that day, but I was never a guy to talk trash or anything like that. Wow. Went out there and played. And then, you know, as it, the crazy part about it, when they realized it was something that, like, the coach would say. We had an assistant coach that would say some shit to you that you want, you want to fight him. you like, dude, hold up. Some <laughs> kids take it personal. Some kids take it personal when you say they don't want to play. For right. me, it was weird. Some of the shit I said, listen, man, like, I ain't going to lie. I, I, I want to knock. And I want to hit it. Like, something that you don't say to nobody. Right, right. Used to, I realized what they was doing. They was getting it out of you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I realized what they kept doing, and they kept doing it. So one game, we was playing downstate against A.J. Guy, and he played with the boys. I had 50, yeah, I had 50 against them. And out of the game, I, got, I said, I know what y'all was doing. I said, so y'all can stop doing that, because some of that stuff, y'all just shouldn't be saying, period, to kids. Right. Uh, every kid ain't going to be able to take that. Right. right. For me, in my sick mind at the time, I just thought it was part of motivation in a crazy way. But then I'm like, hell no, nah, that stuff ain't. You say some of that stuff, these kids today, they'll quit. They'll quit, right? They'll go home and tell their mama. Yeah, a walk, and, and walk off the court. I ain't seen it. Wow. Um, so, I mean, but like this, I tell you guys, like, getting a chance to talk, you know, with, with like Steven Jackson, a lot of the guys that always call in and just be like, Ronnie, you know, they, let's talk basketball, Mike Bibby. A lot of guys in our class that year with that top five in the country that year. And, and um, I think it was Bobby Hurley's dad was the coach of the year on that plaque. It was me, Tim Thomas, Vince. I mean, me, Tim Thomas, Bibby, Jermaine O'Neal, and, and Kobe Bryant. Wow. Top five players in the country. Doubt the top five in the country. And we had every position loaded. Every that, position. Now you oh, talking about that five right there? That's hell, man. And and then I and then the people forget. Stephen Jackson was in that class. Corey Benjamin was in that class as well. Ron yeah. Artest was in that class. Y'all was loaded. Wow, that and was a we, hell of a class. Yeah, we it was it was some battles there, but I learned a lot. Like <laughs> you know, it, especially like even at Dyke Camp when I first got there. And I realized who my backcourt mate was. I'm like, I ain't know too much about AI until then. And you was and a sophomore, was he, though. How was he, Bonnie? I'm a sophomore. You were the only sophomore to play in that game. It, man, listen, hey, you know how sometimes, you know, people getting picked for something, you feel like, damn, you got, you ain't make it or you got left out. Uh -huh. So it was 300 some people there, and they had different level all star games. Mm. So I'm like, they call my, uh, my class, I'm like, Oh, yeah, I should make the sophomore. I'm good. So, man, they called the sophomores, the freshmen, the juniors. I'm like, man, damn. I didn't make damn one of these. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm looking around like, what? wait, wait, what's going on here? Wow. And they called the seniors. And I'm like, okay, I must did some damage. Right. They, yeah. They, I made that game. I was the only sophomore to ever make that game. Yeah, wow. man. I read up on that. And you the third all-time leading scorer in public league history. Man, listen, I was trying to you go. You putting that thing up, wasn't it, man? You know what's so crazy? <laughs> I was 
right, like going into the playoff before I had my accident, I was averaging close to 42 a game. Mm-hmm. And I think at the time it was just, you know how that go. It's good, a lot of good. And then at times in life, you feel like something could go wrong at any time. And for me, that's what it was. Mm. But I had so much of a, 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 a feeling of like nothing can go wrong at that period of as it going into the playoff. Cause I was, this was my, the plan was you already had scouts. They was wondering if you was going to come out, out to Kevin. Mm. And I was, all right, let me go ahead and do damage do the rest of this playoff, rest of the season, and then I was going to declare. For the draft? For the draft. So what happened was, I think the last game of the season against when we had played at home, I had 42. So I'm geared up. I'm on a tear. The last seven games averaging close to 42. So I'm like, okay, playoffs, I'm about to really light it up even more. Mm -hmm. That last game that night, of the last game that weekend before the playoffs started is when I had my accident. Oh, wow. That changed the whole trajectory of my future and a lot of the decision to follow. And at the time of looking at that, I think for me as a young man, when you're young, you can be naive to the situation that can kind of help you get to those things Mm -hmm. because you're young and you don't really see the severity of what just happened because you Mm -hmm. think, all right, you can recover, you can get back. And you just being a kid. But in all actuality of that accident in terms of like the mentality of getting back on the floor was not the same. Mm-hmm. It was never the same from the fact of where I had to have surgery done in terms of my neck mm-hmm. and the way I played. And that was one of the biggest things I remember in pre-draft camp, i never forget this. When all these teams that always was interested, at least about 12 teams, when all those doctors that I had to see at the time when I know, and I knew this inside, I was not physically, I wasn't ready. But when they was hitting me in my neck in that area, I was grim, grimacing so bad to try to show I was good. But you wasn't. They knew it. They knew it. All the doctors knew it. Mm-hmm. Now, and, and, and I couldn't do nothing. Mentally, it was a blow, you know, it was like, you know, you can't really explode. You couldn't really get back healthy at the time of like, these things was around the corner from each other. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, try, you know, just try to fight through it as much as you can. But the, the fit, you know, the, the, the pain and I never get when I, I rushed back and I played in the all-star game. And I think it was me and Paul McPherson. We got a, one of the guards threw a, a, a lob off the backboard. We both went up there and got it together. But when I landed, I just felt where they took the bone out of my hip and put oh. it in my head. I felt like, you ever feel like a burning or internal bleeding that going on? As soon as I landed, I was like, okay, this ain't right. Like, what do I do from this standpoint? Mm. I went back, I had internal bleeding in that, that hip right there where it was it wow just to even get back even when i played in the cba overseas it took some years to just time to get that that form back but it was never to where i was before the accident mm-hmm. man ronnie man I, I think i think your message man that you that you're gonna share with kids man because i know i know you still have your you know your documentary out there we want to definitely you know let people know that you, you that bounce back, uh, Ronnie Fields bounce back documentary is still out, right? Yeah, the biggest thing with we're just talking to the to producers and some of the guys yesterday is they want to finish the other parts of what I'm doing now and 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 with the youth, a lot of things is putting more into it. Yeah, so that mm-hmm. have it come full circle. Yeah, and, and um, you know the guys that done it, like the guy named Thatcher came and um. Of breaking down some more of the footage and a lot of things he got. And the biggest thing with a lot of that is getting clearance from other companies that shot it. That uh-huh. shot the footage. So you want clearance for them and then seeing what the dollar figure per second, per minute, so mm-hmm. much you got to go through with I it. I know, right. So that's one of the things we're trying to finish up, hopefully over the next year or so. But I think, Ronnie, that what you, what you went through, man, uh, I can't imagine. 
you know, uh, the things that you've been through, man, and, 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 and big ups to you as far as that go. And, and, and to, to get out and actually share it with the young youth, tell them your story, man, of the do's and don'ts that this happened to me, you need to go this route, you know. Um, and I think that shows your character, man, of, of who you really are. Growing up on the West Side, you know, I know it's tough. We, we all know growing up in Chicago in general is tough. It's tough. And I think you, you were one of the ones that made it out of the hood, you know, but you still give back to your hood. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. And I think whatever you want, you, you, you do, you put your mind to, man, and you do it. And I, I, could, I, I really want to say congratulations to you, man, because okay. I don't know if that was me of how I would react, you know, because you, know, you just don't know. Like you said, mentally, you was gone, you know? Yeah. It, it's, it's, you, here it is, you playing on the same court with Kobe Bryant and, and all these great basketball players, and you you like, damn. That I'm was sure Ronnie was probably tougher than them. And see, oh, that's Chicago. I know. That's that's the big that, thing that. Know, we already know Chicago guys. Anybody from Chicago, I'm going to always say, we're going to out tough anybody. Exactly. That was one of the biggest things that, and it was crazy when other players from other cities knew this. Mm -hmm. Right. They knew that, like, right off the bat. Hey, I knew that when me and him teaming up in the backcourt, like, oh, oh, I'm good. I got he, this other guy riding over here with me. You got shot out with? Yeah, and because he, he out the same way. Right. So, you know, like I said, Marcus, and, and thank you, like, for, but for me, guys, the, the, you know, looking at the youth today and looking at a lot of stuff that goes on, basketball continue to grow, especially from an AAU level, from the opportunity. And, it, and if, if me and Marcus was playing today, we probably just walk right in the NBA. Right. <laughs> y'all would. Yeah, I like, see both of y'all. It's easier. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like, be listen, be, be a good kid, work hard, and have certain intangibles if you're not a star. Be a good role player. Be a good mm -hmm. practice guy. Be that person that the coaches can depend on for you to do your part. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the most talented guy no more. And some of these sequences, if you watching some of these kids. Mm -hmm. And those things is what goes a long way, especially now, especially the way the game is played. Um, you know, like I said, I think it's, it's more kids that's playing um, the minor league level for the NBA got even bigger in terms of the way they paying guys. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing none of this 10 to 15 years ago right. at all in terms of the way they changing the dynamic of these things. And, um, you know, I tell a lot of the young kids today, I'm so happy that the last dance was show at this time, even though it's fortunate we losing people to the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but to be in the house for a lot of these kids to watch exactly what the greatest player ever endured and how basketball was played in the mindset you need to be great and the mindset you need to be to be disciplined and mm -hmm. get better and a lot of these kids in my program call was like we didn't know i said yeah y'all weren't even born no nah. they like we didn't know it was like that we didn't know basketball was played that way we didn't know michael jordan endured, endured those things i said yeah i said now you see why people say the greatest player ever to play from so many different circumstances on what he did he thought was best for him and the team to be motivated. He went around his way and it worked. Right. It worked. It don't work for everybody. You know, and I think even though Kobe was the closest thing to him, what people don't realize with Kobe, may rest in peace, was like when Kobe's going to that point of and you know, Mike did that. But also a lot of Mike had a lot of good close friends like Barkley and Ewing and mm -hmm. those. Guys. Kobe went that route, but he alienated everybody to in the league where he really had friends like that trying to be, you know, being Mike to a T. And right. Kobe didn't damn about none of that. Um, <laughs> right. It it worked for him, and you know, and that's the next. I mean, the closest thing from that standpoint I ever seen, you know. With putting put it like this, I remember Michael say when he made a comeback, his I think it was first comeback or second comeback. We had rent the gym out down at Hoops, and I was playing with Dallas Comedy G's and David Booth. You know those, Lip. Yeah. 
and we was in there and everybody, you know, you got to pick your players, pick who you're going to guard. So of course, Michael say, okay, everybody go to everybody else. And then they leave me. And he say, hey, you young fella, come on out here. The biggest thing in my mind at the time was defending was watching in, in my head everything I seen him do or what I think he would do at that moment. Right. But it's different when you're watching and thinking, and he already had dunked the ball. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a really, really good defender. Man, listen, I did it, and he just looked back and winked. The only thing I did is just like, as a kid in the candy store, I'm trying to like not smile and like, okay, I <laughs> let him know, okay, I ain't just gonna be your practice dummy out here at all. Right. You know, Mike always kept a guy that's an enforcer to uh -huh. set screens if it wasn't Oakley. Or if he wasn't in pickup ball, he had Richard Dent. Oh, come on, man, damn defensive end. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you know this, Shelly Clark. Oh, yeah, oh man, Shelly Clark. Shelly, man, listen, these hard ass screens you said, I'm, I'm just going, you know what? I'm going to switch off. Every time you come in and, and come, Mike calls and set these damn screens. Man. <laughs> so this is what he did. And I just switched off. Mike tried to throw a pocket pass off the screen. I stole it. Went down, dunked it. And the first thing he said, your instincts. It's as like, he said, your instincts to read that, and young, and, you know, as a young man was, you know, impressive to him. Right. Like watching guys as y'all came up, like you and Kobe, he said, you have a lot of my grades and skills that are able to finish in, on balance and maneuver in the air. What Kobe have is a lot of things from my footwork, my groundwork, my fadeaway. But y'all both had the same mentality that I have. Right. It's like putting me and Kobe together and it's him. Wow. 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 To hear wow. from the my to hear from oh. MJ. And the the us guys at the time of like looking at this thing and even other guys, Bibby and Corey Benjamin and Steven Jackson was like, Ronnie was the guy, Kobe came out of nowhere. Right. And it's like, those guys was like, was monsters in their own right. And then this was, this was so crazy because I, I never looked at it like that and looked at myself that way. These guys was looking at me like that. And I'm thinking we all on the same level. You know, we both in camp, but they were looking at me bigger than them. Wow. Right. And I never looked at it like that. I'm like, happy we all playing together. Damn. But that's when you realize you earned a lot of respect of these people, these young kids, your age following you. That's why I say people look at Zion and the, imagine if we was able to have social media. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Oh. You and Liv, because I seen both of y'all in high school. Yeah, it, it would have been it would have been ridiculous. I'm talking about Ronnie Young, especially with, especially with you, Ronnie. I mean, you playing with you know Kevin likes Kevin, you know Garnett, and then Michael Wright. I mean, you guys had a squad, man. Like, you know, you know, and all you got both all three of you guys were special in your own way too, man. I mean, it, Michael Wright was a beast. I mean, he's like he was that enforcer and. and Kevin Garnett could do his little fight, you know, his finesse and do all his things. And yeah. Michael Wright was that that dog, you know, like, yeah, come on down here and get some of this what you want. I, I remember that, man. You're right about Michael, man, man. Michael Wright was the guy like uh, Anthony Mason mentality, the way he played in terms of like, he was going to go left and kill you with that left regardless. <laughs> Take his elbows and come through your face with it. Yeah, <laughs> and then and this thing, he didn't really jump high at all. No, nope. it was all on the floor, just destroying you. But this thing, what made all us better in practice? Me and Kevin was never on the same team. That's good. Wolf would never put us on the same team. He'd get me, and Michael, me and Michael Wright be on the same team, and then he had Jamel Roman. His other kid that didn't nobody get a chance to see because he wouldn't be patient was six six, and was just like the most powerful, explosive kid. His name Lakeith Henderson. Lakeith Henderson. Wow. And he would have just waited, waited his turn like I did, 
for the guys who was in front of me, even if I was more talented, I still respect those guys that was there before me and waited my turn to like hand me the keys. And even I started to get that my junior year, and then Kevin came up. I was like, oh, I got a part of the crap. So I ain't mind taking the back seat. Right. And I'm so, glad you said that, man. And my senior year was just me. And it's supposed to be me and Kiki that I had me and I had Michael Wright, a young Michael Wright who had came to his own, but Kevin had made him better. You know, just the the mentality. And I tell people, you know, stories where but these kids now don't understand being on time or being ready to practice, being prepared, where I told them one time when me and Kevin wasn't on time, and the coach made us walk home, kicked us right out of practice. Like, guys looking around like, you kicked them out? And I told them, <laughs> <laughs> they like, the coach kicked you? I said, yeah. you made us run, told us not to even come back, and we couldn't play the next three games. Wow. It wasn't, and I tell it was like, and, and like they say, what you're the, like, shoot, we had to listen. I mean, that we learned our lesson. You don't give a damn about the status of who you are or nothing. Like, you got a team, you got players. If you're going to set the tone for the rest of these guys down here, I'm going to start with you guys. And we just, we just, we just like, damn, man, we ain't going to be able to play. And, I, and Ronnie, I always like your coach too. Coach Wolf, man, I, I think he was a good coach, man. And I think he didn't never get his just do either, man. Like, like Pete, you know, with all the great, you know, legends. Still coaching too, right? The coaching, up, but he's like now, Marcus, it's not like, you know, like you had a great coach in high school. I had Wolf, but like now the kids ain't the same. But right. Wolf ain't as hard as I, like. I'm looking at these guys not even in the same vicinity of what me and Kevin accomplished, and they don't even listen. He don't even tell them get out. Wow, it he changed. can't. It had changed so much, and that's just like I was like, I don't want to. I think when I, you know, when I was done playing, and my coach, you know, my agent said, "Look, why don't you get into doing this?" I think the first thing I did, Marcus, because I have been playing and traveling. I just look back and watch travel ball to see what had changed. Since then, you've been gone from here playing over the past 16, 17 years. What has changed? Before you get into it, you like, do you teach or coach him like how you was coached? Right. But stuff you can't say or you, you adopt. And the biggest thing that I did was balance the both. Mm -hmm. uh, it one get them to trust you, know about them, and let them know that you care about them more so than them just dribbling the ball first. But now they earn the respect of you and trust you where they willing to work hard for you. Mm -hmm. Come in with them, hey, run them suicides. Or this. I knew that wouldn't work when I seen and just took a year to watch the way the kids was. I said, no, no way in the world I'm going to coach them like I was coached. Mm -hmm. they quit right away so I had to meet them halfway mm -hmm. and the thing it was just understanding kids come in with two parents kids come in with one parent kids come in with maybe a grandma some kids come in with no parent mm -hmm. got to always look at the mood the different faces of one kid watching the mom and dad or a kid from the suburb with a family pull up in a nice car and then a kid from the city because I have a balance of both Mm -hmm. And have much family self is trying to balance and for all of them to see something different but in each other to play together on the floor in the respect aspect that I treat them all the same for the guy that was at the last guy to the first guy and gave them all equal opportunities but was willing to you know be fair and that's the trust aspect with a lot of these youth that they need it. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. You say that too, man. That you had to change your how, how you was taught so to 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 meet and meet those kids halfway because sometimes you're right. These kids will shut down. You get on them and be all tough and like you were raised, and and they, they'll they'll walk away from the game and say, "I don't want to," because Coach Phil screamed at me, Mom. I can't I can't do that. So you have to reach the kids where they at. 
I do understand that, Ronnie, because that's the same thing what I do, man, here uh, in Sarasota, man, that a lot of these parents, and a lot of these parents, how, what do you think about this, Ronnie? A lot of the parents, I think they wanted more than the kids. You know? Yeah. And, Big- and I don't know if you get that a lot in your program, but I get it a lot sometime in my program. So just talk a little bit about, you know, what the parents, you know, role should be, you know, instead of, you know, trying to think that your kid is going to be the next Ronnie Fields, you know, <laughs> and chime in a little bit on that. I think like from like, even though you're a little bit older than me, but then even from my era of getting, still been able to get some of that era, even when you played in the, in the Jordan eras and, and your in your upbringing and when you played as well in, in, in college, I think those parents now that either have kids thought that way from watching you or watching myself to what, how we was playing and what we did to maybe now looking at their kids, even in a new era of thinking they should think that way too. Right. Mm-hmm. But they were caught up with more the social media aspect of, fast publicity, put a mixtape together, throw it on, and they think that should get them where they need to go. <laughs> and that's what it is. They like, the parents thinking like us when you say they wanted more because they thinking like we did because they in our age era. Mm-hmm. I get that. And they thinking the kids should be like them or like us. Right. Mm. They got too much access to what this guy put on YouTube or this highlight this guy posted or what they said about this kid or, hey man, did you see this kid right behind his back? See that guy? That, okay. That's what more what they looking at. And and that's where it comes in. For me, it's like trying to find a balance of, like I said, old school, a little bit of new school, but teaching them like, hey, if you want to get here, regardless of how far you go is going to take some work to really figure out mm-hmm. how good to be. You will never know it if you don't really give it your all. This is the mm-hmm. number one thing I tell people. If it's something that's for you and meant, you give it your all to find out first by the work you put in. And if it's not, then at least you can walk away and be happy saying, hey, I gave that everything. Mm-hmm. I don't have to look back and say, man, what if for? Man, I regret. No, go ahead and go for it if you want to do it. Mm-hmm. That's what I try to tell these young kids. And it's not saying, I mean, okay, like you're not going to be great at something, but at least you gave it a shot to see could you be great at this. And this project's not for you. But there's something else. If you put the same effort and energy in, it might be something else that's for you. And Ronnie, another thing I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to let Rob, I, think, I know Rob got some questions before we no, get No, I, I just have one question. You go right. in there. I'm but good. Ronnie, you were second, the best two guard, right, behind Kobe. Yeah. Right? So you were being recruited by a lot of high major, you know, top universities, but you chose to stay home. You picked DePaul. And is that because you saw that? What the guys who was before you, like a Quentin Richardson, the Q, all those guys, when they went to DePaul, and then DePaul started to go down a little bit, and you're like, I'm gonna stay home and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this thing for Chicago. I think that like Q them was around a little bit my age, but a little bit after me. But for me, it was the McGuire's that had played there. And when another thing, I think when I was going to those games, and that was the first time I got a chance to see Penny Hardaway. And I was like, man, this kid is nice. <laughs> and when that, because remember, because like in that conference, I don't know, it was Conference USA. Yep. It's a play DePaul. Yep. Yeah. So that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to get a chance to play against these guys. But my, the, the secret dark horse team and the coach I really wanted to play for was Jim Behan in Syracuse. Wow. It makes two of, it makes two of y'all. Yep, I was too. I was I was wow. That's crazy. At Syracuse. 
And the crazy part about it, the guy, and this is going to blow your mind, Mark, the guy that was really on me, and it's crazy because it came full circle, that who brought me in to New Jersey on a call-up when he was at the Nets was John Calipari. Wow. Wow. And then, and as it's, it's weird, as I watched him after that, to Derrick Rose. All the players that he went and got, that's where was at when he the one called me up out of nowhere. Wow. And they ended up letting them go. They ended up letting them go. Yeah. Wow. But it wow. was very. And then years later, you get Derrick Rose. And then he went on the tear and started getting everybody. Yep. And that's wow. why a lot of those things, I was like, wow, this was one of the guys that already had a vision on what he wanted to do with guards like us. Yep. And when he left and then the Nets, the Nets cut him, he went to college in Memphis. He started with Derrick. And then he had John Wall. I mean, the list goes on and on. That's so, yeah, all those guys. Yeah. All those guys he went and got. And that was his vision once he left and decided to go back to college on how he was going to start building these powerhouses like he did. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget that when he called me up and he was sitting there talking to him, he's like, hey, I want you to come back, you know, especially for um, us. They let him go, but I still came back. And that's when they, I was in the battle of that second position with Kerry Kittles. Kerry Kittles. Wow. <laughs> and Kendall Gill was there. KG, okay. The other <laughs> KG, the other KG. And then they brought in and they let go him and Eddie Jordan. And this is where I, to the day, I can't stand Byron Scott. That's who they brought in. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and he didn't he like me as soon as he walked in. I don't know why. Chicago, man, we get that bad rap, man. Yeah, we was talking about that on another show, Ronnie, that, that sometimes <laughs> Chicago kids, man, we get bad rap we for whatever the reason. Man. Um, it happens. But go ahead, Rob, ask your question. No, I just, you know what, man? Uh, this is one of the few interviews where I can just sit back and I can just enjoy it because I got two Chicago legends here talking, man. I just want to tell y'all, man, great job, man, after playing and all of that. And, you know, where did the humility come from in you, um, uh, uh, Ronnie? Where did being so humble come from, man? Because, dude, I'm, I'm like, dang, this dude is not big-headed. Man, for me, I, you know, like, you know, I tell Mark, like, for us, you know, just to make it to be known for, uh, you know, maybe more positive things to come out of Chicago than negative, I think that is more gratifying. And I think even for people who say, I mean, for me, it's a great reward for guys like Mark as yourself and other, my peers, even guys in the league from Tim Duncan, Vince Carter, Vince Carter, them to speak highly of me, of saying, this is one of the best players that we, the world never got a chance to see on this mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. You know, it's humbling to hear that from those guys. Wow. So, um, and, and being a part of, like, when I always hit this debate on Facebook and all these other things about who is the greatest Chicago basketball player. And then I, I, one time I had to chime in. Normally I never chime in on some of these comments. Nice. But let me tell y'all something. To compare the greatest Chicago basketball player, when you got all these guys, and this is the thing, from Marcus to Jamie to myself, from Tim, Isaiah, Mark. done something so impactful that it left a legacy in a name where you hear Marcus Liberty, you hear that name, you hear Jamie Brand, regardless of what you, you know you had done something. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know you had, had done something that, like Marcus has done things that I never could dream about doing. Mm -hmm. So everybody made a, a like a, a, their statue in their own right of their accomplishment where, hey, you should have seen this player. Where they, a lot of people keep saying all these names to mention in that category for the debates, the people should tell you, everybody was so great in their own right of what that's they right. did and, and dominate right. in what they did. And that's why I tell people like, you can't, like that you don't compare those things there. You can say these was your favorites. Exactly. Right. 
okay, that's that's fair. But you got to look at like when you start mentioning guys, the, the Ben Wilsons, all these guys, they had done something for you to still be talking about 15 years later. Years later. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So that's where the debate stopped for me because you're like, man, damn. These guys all have made these impacts like this, so we still talking about them. That's right. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, Ronnie. Uh, I, I hear it all the time too, man. And, and Rob knows this. I never get involved with none of these debates when you try to say who's the greatest of the ever come a high school basketball player. I think, like you just mentioned, we all did our thing, man, and we all should be proud to say. I knew Ronnie Fields, man. I watched him, man. I, I watched Ben Wilson. I watched Marcus. I watched Isaiah. And them guys were bad, man. Quit trying to separate us so much and then making each other not like somebody not like Ronnie is because you said exactly. this player is better than him. Time y'all hear me talk of anything you hear people like. For me, I'm looking up like, because I only heard all y'all names when I was like little. So I'm going to be like, God damn, how do I how do I get to them? You know what right. I'm saying? How do I get mentioned like them guys? Uh, <laughs> so that's what's that's up, man. And we was like, God damn, I'm telling Coach Wolf, I'm like, man, hey, you know, how do I get to these guys, y'all, all, and, you know, letting me know, schooling me about, and then I got a chance to start watching some of y'all highlights, y'all films. I'm like, damn. <laughs> I'm like, these guys, six, five, six, six, I'm like, <laughs> You know, so, I mean, to be able to, like, try to, to get mentioned and, you know, in the same breath with you guys, and even, like I said, even coming out when I first seen even watching and getting a chance to play against Antoine Walker at the time when I was like, okay, how the hell guys this big? And this before Kevin was guy here. I'm like dribbling the ball, shooting three. <laughs> what the hell? Like, you know, so for me, at the time when I started seeing guys like that size, Marcus Quantum, I'm like, no way in hell I could be able to be mentioning those guys because I thought you had to have a height requirement. <laughs> you think like that when you're a kid. You think like that when you're a kid. Oh. So, so, but man, for me, like I said, a lot of guys. If you want to like write this list, and it goes on and on. Uh, that's just to show how many great players to come out of this city, mm-hmm. and more names, and the more the other guys that keep coming up and keep coming out. It's, and even thinking about the ones that didn't have explosive name, the, the Tony Allens, the Will Bynum. Yes. These guys played years and years in the league. So, mm-hmm. like I said, it's just, I mean, the list goes on and on. And that's why we call it All Ball Chicago, man. Really, we, we, we want to we pay homage to a lot of guys, man, that that was did their thing in, in basketball in Chicago, man. And I think we have so much people, so many people that want to be negative towards each other. And I said, and I, we can't be like that. Oh, no, yeah, I don't understand that at all. I remember one time with some idiots when Derek was going through, you know, he had his injuries. And I, I had to chime and say, guys, be for real. Right. Like, what are y'all talking about? The man injured. Right. right. You know, like, like, and for them people, and I never want to say to people like, oh, you never play ball. I hate to say those things. Right. Honestly. You can be a fan of fanatic and you can disagree to certain things, but certain things you don't say for a person of like, okay, he has some injuries, but then respect that he's a great player. Just he had injuries that happened, but some people say some of the most stupidest things. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. So man, that's uh Ronnie. I know you got to go, man, but I want you to uh, give some kind of advice uh, to the next young generation of, 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 of hoopers, whether it's a, you know female or male, uh, of what it takes, you know, and we to make it, you know, in high school basketball and then college and then if you you know if it's permitted, you know, to the next level, NBA or overseas. I think for me is that the first thing to start with is the mind, the men, the mental part of things in life. I tell people. Being blessed with a talent after everything that I've been through, and as I look back, I think not the physical attributes, but the mental attributes I think I'm thanking God for to make it through those things mentally. If you can be mentally tough through 
adversity in life that you're going to face, everybody going to face. Mm -hmm. That can make you and let you know that you're capable of achieving anything you need to. But you got to put the work, the time and the dedication into it. Whether it's school, whatever job you have, whatever craft it may be. And a lot of these people don't realize sometimes you can be going through something and you say, man, I've been working, I've been doing this. And I always tell people this, the Lord allow us to make so many mistakes and forgive us in life to where when the time is where we had turned around and he has shown us him that we start to follow and expect him to self gratify right self gratification right away mm. instead of looking at years of the lord putting up with the stuff that we had done to like we can't be patient for the time for whatever he's going to show you for your turnaround in life to sit there and wait instead of saying man i've been doing this for three four weeks and nothing no it don't work <laughs> like that in life it don't happen right. when you want to because you decided to now it don't work <laughs> like that you know and i try to tell people patience yes. myth, mental toughness it can carry you a long way in life you know and that's one of the biggest things i try to tell a lot of you youngsters my nephews family is one of the things that have brought me through life mm -hmm. being built mentally um to withstand and understand you know the lord can bless you in so many different ways of life that sometimes you overlook and you like looking at it from a pure basketball standpoint to not the, the the brain capacity that where you like damn all this stuff happened this incident happened again that car accident this happened like okay what in the hell going on wow but the the, the mental part of it to stay strong through all that even watching my friends playing the league a lot of guys like you're happy to be a part of it but then you still fight mentally continue to yourself and i say if you like i said if you got a strong mind and being able to understand the mistakes in life that you may make and keep moving forward in a positive direction, then those things will turn around for you. Wow. That's good. Yeah. That's real talk right there, Ronnie. And Ronnie then, Fields, you dropped jewels, boy. And then, Ronnie, <laughs> make, make sure you, you know, let the let our listeners know, man, about your documentary. You, you know, you say that you're coming out, you're adding some more stuff. And we want you to come back on, too, man, to promote. Oh, yeah, that. definitely. And um, and we gonna help promote it too, man, because that that it needs to be heard. I mean, need to be seen your documentary, man, because I think it's gonna be a lot of key touching points for people to 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 help them get through their day, man. Because you went through a lot, brother. You did. Yeah. You went through a lot, and to you know, and get through that, man. That's big ups to you, dude. Man, thank you guys, man. It's been an honor just to sit down and talk to you guys, man. And thank you for having me on. And like I said, anything I can share with the youth and best people of the day and if it can help you know you know god bless my man well, we, we plan on having a alumni edition uh ronnie so you got some okay. of them uh guys from your school Farragut, they want to come on y'all come on man bring the alumni on man we want to talk to y'all man because man definitely man let me know anytime y'all want to have me back on just hit me up who was the, who, who would be y'all rival uh when you was at Farragut? marshall oh, or god western house Westinghouse, oh, okay. Kiwan, Kiwan Garris was over there, Jimmy Sanders. Michael, uh -oh. Herman. Michael Herman been to about 10 different schools, but he was over there. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Herman was another bad boy like y'all, man. Hey, listen, that's why I always tell, like, this was so crazy. Uh -uh. When I talk about the kids, like, people like, say, Marcus and the older guys that, and achieve so much. And then I break down to some of the younger guys about like a Michael Herman they may have heard of. They're like, who is that? I say, y'all would be surprised. I know that yeah. boy, man, that boy can get the buckets. Damn. They'll be surprised, man. I seen him rip Randy Brown apart, but that's another show. Oh, yeah, I remember that was <laughs> That was an IT. That's for another show though. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, guys. So, so this is what we gonna do, man. I, I, uh, we gonna do an alumni edition, you know. We probably gonna we put your your group on, and then we'll we'll find the Westinghouse guys and get them on, 
and just reminisce, man, not talking no trash about I did this or that. This, you know, y'all get together, fellowship, man, because I think some of you guys, a lot of people don't know or how to hang out with each other. So we're going to make it yeah. happen, you know, where everybody's yeah. together. Let's get them in, man. Next week, next Friday, man. We open. Man, what you say? Me up, let me know, man, so I can call some of the guys like Jimmy Sanders, Mark Miller, I mean, Keywan Garrett, all those guys that was over at West House. Wow. Wow. Yeah, they, they had, it. Hey, they had a crew too over the years, man. You yeah. know, man, Hersey Hawkins was over there. I mean, think about who else played in West, West Town. Mar McGuire. Yeah, Eddie John Randolph. Man, they had. Yeah, I think Skip the Dillards boys too. The Dillards, right? Yeah, Skip yeah, Dillard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dillards, yeah, they played over there. I mean, yeah, um, yeah it's been a lot of guys, man. Chicago just loaded with talent. That I West know. Side, though, Ronnie, that West Side was a mug, man. I played on that West Side one year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, playing in Farragut, man, and they throwing up that gang signs, man. And I'm like, what the <laughs> hard nose out there, what it is. Man, man, it was crazy, man. And that's why I tell people. But I right, love Martin, playing it was like, West Side. I love playing on that West Side. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was that crazy, man. I was just like, tell guys, man, listen, you had to be mentally tough. I mean, you got guys in the stand saying some shit to you like, you yeah. like, man, this too much. What? <laughs> so you had to be mentally tough on the floor to go out there and still do your thing out the guy telling you, oh, we, we going to see you after this game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Roddy, I always, tell, I always tell people, I got the taste of both sides. I played on the west side and I played on the south side. I said, oh. and I tell people the difference between the west side and the south side to me is the west side, man, you might be going against little short guards, but they gonna be all up in you talking. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. It's make you it's gonna make you a tougher player, man. And that's what yeah. I, I liked about the west side. And then I go to the south side and I'm like, man, if I could play on the west side, I know I could play on the south side, oh, man, because yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, and that's what it was. It was just like because a lot of guys, you were you like you said, was smaller guards yeah so that was what they knew how to do was just get in you yeah and that's why it's like hey you better learn how to do something if not these guys will make you look bad yeah <laughs> yeah you know, so. and, that, and, and that's what a lot of people don't understand ronnie when i when i played on that west side i was six six seven handling the ball so i'm like you know what i'm gonna get the ball and go coast to coast because the man who trying to guard me can't guard me Exactly. <laughs> I was gone. You know, but yeah. I love man, I love the West Side, man. I got number of love for the West Side, you know, Hoopers, man. Uh so Me but too. Yeah, I, I love the West got, Side too, man. Yeah, you love that West Side? What the food out west, man? Come on, man. Yeah, yeah you would been probably went over to MacArthur's and had some of their soul food. That's that's, that's 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 actually my wife's uh godfather, man. Been up oh, and wow. ate everything. Yeah, man. Wow. I like Abe and Thomas too over there. Is that on Chicago Avenue with the they closed that place down? Did they close it? Yeah, man. Yeah. I got to tell them, this is the thing. Hey, <laughs> listen, hey, hey, Mark, man, where in the world, who in the hell got the original real Steel Harold's chicken sauce? Ooh. <laughs> like, it's hard where? To like, I'm up here getting mad at them. Like, they're putting them out here in the suburbs where I'm at, and it ain't even taste the same. It don't taste. No. I'm like, where could I find that original? Man, it's yeah, that, hard, man. That's J and J's. You don't know which one is which, right? Man, man, they all over the place. I'm like, look, let me. I need that authentic taste from back in the days, man. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> you got me over here hungry now, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. man. We, gotta, we gotta get on out of here, though, man. I know you all guys, right, man. and I appreciate you, man, and I love you, brother. Man, love you too, man. Guys, keep up what y'all doing, man. Love. Thanks for having me on, man. And God bless, guys. God bless. All Ball Chicago. Ronnie Fields in the building. All right, baby. My man Marcus Liberty. We up out of here, y'all. Peace. Peace. All right. All right.